Hi, and welcome to everyone joining us tonight. I am Shyla Nieves Bernie. I'm the founding and managing partner for Zane Venture Fund um, here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I want to thank Start Out for this opportunity to moderate tonight's demo day. And I want to also thank them for all the work they do to support the diverse entrepreneurial community. So at this time, I would like to welcome one of our sponsors, Chris Young from Start Out. Great, thanks Shyla. Hi everybody, my name is Chris Young. I am the uh, chair of Start Out and thank you all for joining us this evening. We are uh, in for a real treat with some exciting entrepreneurs and some really cool companies uh, presenting. So, uh, so before we uh, kick off, uh, I wanted to begin and provide a quick background on Start Out. Uh, we are a US-based nonprofit uh, whose mission is to increase the number, the diversity, and the impact of LGBTQ entrepreneurs and really amplify their stories to drive the economic empowerment of the community. Over the past 10 years, we've built a community of over 17,000 members. So if you're a founder of a scalable startup, Startout provides direct individual support through community events, one-on-one -on -one mentorships, office hours with experts, investor connections and the start out growth lab a biannual accelerator so definitely consider joining our community uh, by visiting uh, www.startout.org uh, next i'd like to thank our amazing corporate sponsors uh, amazon aws and svb for their support with this event uh, and more generally for their support uh, for our organization uh, they're really both fantastic partners and incredibly passionate about Start Out and our mission. So thank you very much uh, for, for your support. And last, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that today is Giving Tuesday. And if you can, please make a donation today by texting Start Out to 44321. Any support will help start out, continue our programs like this demo day and support all of our members worldwide. So with that, uh, let me uh, thank you all once again for attending and let me introduce you to Ari Kalfayan of AWS. Ari, you? Perfect. Rookie mistake. Hi, folks. My name is Ari Kalfayan. I'm part of the AWS BD team. It's so cool to be sitting on the other side of the table now, eight years since pitching at Demo Day. Uh, been a part of the startup community, from start out community from the very beginning, uh, 10 startups in, and I work at AWS helping early stage AI ML startups get off the ground. So, why we're sponsoring is to make it easier for the next generation of founder. I remember the struggles 10 years ago starting my company, trying to find funding, connecting with amazing talent, um, and we've created an ecosystem to help you. So we're going to run through that at the end of the presentation while the judges are deliberating. But until that point, I want to introduce Julie O'Shaughnessy to talk a little bit about how AWS can help. Awesome. Thanks, Ari. So excited to be sitting here uh, alongside you and everyone else. Um, so let me just give everybody a little brief, brief intro. Um, I feel that it's important to share the personal side of why I and my team at AWS are thrilled to be sponsoring this event today. My name is Julia O'Shaughnessy. My pronouns are she, her. I'm based in New York City with my wife, although we've been riding out COVID in New England, where we're both originally from. I've been at AWS for a little over three and a half years now, and I lead our global operations team for the startup business development organization. I also serve on the Greater New York City Glamazon chapter, which is our LGBTQ plus affinity group at AWS and Amazon. And additionally, I serve as vice chair on the board of directors for the Ally Forney Center, the largest organization helping LGBTQ plus homeless youth in the United States. I felt that it was important to give you all a small snippet into who I am as I spend the next minute or so talking to you about a little bit why um, we're sponsoring today. 
I made a commitment personally seven years ago to bring my authentic self to work and to speak in public forums around inclusion, diversity, and equity. The work will never be done here. And I feel that it's my responsibility to continue pushing for equity for everyone, just as our community did before us. And I know that my team in AWS feels the same way because in my role as head of operations, it's just not focused on business ops, but more so on culture. And I firmly believe that inside and out, the methodology that we internally in our organization at AWS must improve the quality of life and equity for our underrepresented minority colleagues, our LGBTQ plus colleagues and women, so we can better support our entire customer base. And this is what I'm extremely proud to be a part of AWS for. Our leadership cares about linking inclusion, diversity, and equity to the culture. And we care about continuing to build the community trust. And that's with you. Our partnership with Startout is just one action we've taken as a part of larger ID and new strategy. And I couldn't be more thrilled to have this demo day, demo day be a part of our reInvent agenda this year. Lastly, I want to thank the SVB team. SVB shares this same passion with us. And it's been fantastic working with their leaders on this particular partnership with Startout. So thank you to Cyan Gomel, Jennifer Friel Goldstein, Alina Zinchek, and James Wilson. I'd also like to thank Brad Steele, our AWS Head of Startup Business Development, who is also on the judging panel tonight. So without further ado, I'm kicking it over to James at SVB so we can get to all of the fabulous pitches we have tonight. Thank you so much, Julie, and thank you for sharing your story. Um, hey, everyone, I'm James Wilson, and I'm really excited to represent Silicon Valley Bank as one of the co-sponsors for um, today's demo day. Um, you know, I, I really um, wanted to echo what Chris and Julie just said um, about SVB's role in the startup ecosystem. We feel very strongly about um, amplifying um, you know, the minority founder story and uh, increasing access to opportunity and capital. Um, so if you bear with me, I will just spend a couple minutes doing a quick um, background of SVB, and I hope everyone can see my screen. Is that, is that a yes? Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, so SVB was founded uh, with a focus on the startup and innovation ecosystem. Um, I'm part of our startup banking team. We work with companies that are really early. So quite often um, a founder's first call is to their law firm uh, to incorporate, and we are their second call to set up a bank account. And our hope is uh, that we work with our companies across their entire life cycle. So we like to say from seed through IPO and beyond. We have a fully built out uh, commercial banking platform. So as our companies scale, we can prepare them with um, sector teams. Um, you can see here that we cover pretty much all the subsectors that fall within um, the technology umbrella. And we have various products and services that we can layer on as our company scale. SVB is a global bank. We have a presence pretty much everywhere. There's a startup ecosystem. Uh, most recently, we opened offices in Germany and Vancouver, Canada. And I just wanted to highlight um, two numbers on this slide. The first is uh, we have close to 20,000 technology companies across the US. And uh, why that's important is we have some really good uh, data and we can share best practices with our companies about what similar stage companies are doing. In fact, we put out a state of the markets report every quarter. Um, so I encourage you all to check it out. Um, one interesting tidbit from our Q4 report, we saw a 25% increase in cash runway for our companies. Uh, in Q3 or Q2, and so a lot of people were focused on cutting expenses, improving runway, uh, which is very understandable given everything that happened this year with COVID. And uh, all the way on the right, 
we're really excited that 85% of all U.S. tech companies that went public this year bank with SAB. So uh, we take our role in the ecosystem very seriously. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to hear all the founder pitches today and I'm excited to do more with Startup. And with that, I'll kick it back to Shyla to, to get the, everything going. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. I, we appreciate um, our sponsors and of course, start out for um, uh, the, having this event tonight. So now we wanna welcome our judges. So first up, let us welcome, um, I'm sorry, Alexis Alston from Lightship Capital. Good evening, everyone. I am so excited to be joining you all, uh, at least via audio and excited to see the great pitches. Uh, and Brad Steele from AWS. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, this is a real pleasure to be on tonight. I'm sorry I can't be on video either due to Mac OS issues, but a uh, real pleasure to be here. Thank you. And then lastly, we have Wolf Star from the Pride Fund. Thank you so much. It's, it's a real pleasure and honor to get to see these pitches and be joined with these judges and partners. Awesome. Let's get started. We have some incredible entrepreneurs showcasing their company tonight, and we look forward to hearing from each of tonight's participants. First up, we have Marcus, I'm sorry, Demarcus Davis, the founder of Music Book. Hello, hello. I think I'm just waiting for permissions. There we go. I am a classically trained violinist. Uh, my violin has taken me around the world to places like Ireland, the Czech Republic, Germany, and even Carnegie Hall in New York, but my story didn't begin there. I am Demarcus Davis, founder and CEO of Music Book. When I began playing the violin, I was at one of the lowest points in my life. My parents had lost their jobs, we lost our home, and I lost my voice. The violin for me became my voice, but when my orchestra teacher saw that I wasn't progressing as quickly as other students, she recommended I find an outside music instructor, but this proved difficult. In the US alone, over 4 million people just like me want to learn how to play music, but don't have a reliable path to get there. And it shouldn't be a surprise because the music instructors who would likely teach them often are performers in major orchestras and operas, and as a result, don't market themselves. Until now, Music Book is a virtual music education marketplace that gives students access to trusted, vetted professional music instructors for one-on-one -on -one music lessons. When a student comes to the Music Book site, they're first given a survey to help us identify their needs. And from there, they're shown a list of rec highly recommended instructors, and they can choose their instructor who they would want to study with. On their instructor's page, they can see things like their bio, as well as past student reviews, and book a lesson which they confirm with a credit card. Now, these lessons are booked based off the instructor's availability, and once the request is sent, the instructor approves them, and an automated calendar invite is sent to both the student and instructor. After the lesson's taken place, the instructor simply presses a button, and then the student's card is charged, and that instructor is paid within five to seven business days. Now, we've had so much success with this model that within eight months, we've already garnered over 150 world-class instructors. And these are some of the top musicians coming from organizations like the New York Philharmonic, the Houston Grand Opera, and even the London Symphony Orchestra. As a result, 75% of our students take lessons consistently for six months or more. Additionally, we completed the Tech Stars Accelerator, have secured contracts with Adidas, and most recently garnered an investment from Google. But you're probably wondering, who's the team behind this? Well, as mentioned, I am a professional violinist. I went to the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, and as of this morning, I was named a 2021 Forbes 30 Under 30 honoree. I've also been a guest lecturer at Stanford University on music and innovation, and I have an incredible team behind me, all serving this mission of democratizing access to music education. At Music Book, we believe that every person deserves the opportunity to study music, regardless of their background. We believe that not every entrepreneur wears an E on their chest, but that some are called music instructors and simply need a little bit of help organizing their businesses. And we believe that music education provides a light at the end of the tunnel in uncertain times. So if you believe what we believe, I ask that you join us on our mission of making quality music education accessible to the world. Any questions? Sure, we'll have questions from our judges now. 
I'll start. Hi, DeMarcus. You know I'm a huge fan. Uh, this is Alexis. Tell me a little bit more about how does business development look for you in the post-COVID world in terms of getting access to new potential students? Yeah, so in a post-COVID world, um, I think we can really double down on a lot of the partnerships that we've had with school districts. Um, so one example is we had a partnership with Atlanta Public Schools this year. Um, as a result, essentially, Atlanta Public Schools became a distribution partner for us in which they sent out an email saying, hi, this is a trusted service provider for your students who might not be able to get music classes this year due to COVID restrictions. So in a COVID world, band and chorus programs are the most heavily affected because most of the students are either playing wind instruments or opening their mouths to sing. As a result, most of these programs stop. And so through that partnership, we were able to garner a number of students. But because of the fluctuation of the school year, it's become very, very inconsistent for students to start lessons or stop because they never know what their school schedule is going to look like. So in a post-COVID world, we're definitely going to be doubling down on those partnerships because it costs us no money. It takes a little bit of time out of us, um, our schedules, in order to develop those relationships. But it's definitely a huge revenue driver for us because the school districts essentially become the voice of reason for the parents and they're a trusted voice at that and they have the ear of the parents so we'll definitely be doubling down on those relationships to be able to drive more students to the platform hey demarcus this is brad Steele, at aws uh, love the personal story um yep. love seeing a musician turn entrepreneur really really cool and inspiring um thank you thank you how do you uh, is this like is this a, a subscription sort of model? What's the what's the revenue model for the um, for the student? And then how do you ensure? Have you thought about how you ensure the um, the instructor doesn't just go off on the side and, and create a side deal with the student? Absolutely. So um, we do this a couple of ways. Um, one, we're e-commerce, but we operate a lot like SaaS. And I say that because on average, our students are taking 36 lessons per year. So students who take music lessons on average are taking about three to four lessons per month, typically three if you account for summer break and things of that nature. And so we get a student who comes back very long term, which is why our retention is so important. Um, the way we prevent circumvention, though, is because of our revenue model, believe it or not. So we take 50% of the first lesson with a new student and an instructor. And for context, our average lesson cost on our platform is $85 an hour. So we're getting about 40 of that, a little bit more than that, actually. Additionally, we tack on a 10% service charge to every single lesson. So if a student is booking an $80 an hour lesson, they're paying $88 for it. So we're walking away with around, I would say, $48, $50 from that first lesson. After that point, we actually pay our instructor 100% of their rate and we get the 10% service charge for each additional lesson. We do that because one, we're working with the top instructors in the industry, so they aren't going to stand around for us to take 20, 30%. That's when they would go and make those side deals. But because we're actually ensuring that when they get paid, because there is a credit card on file for every single lesson. So if a student were to say not show up for a lesson, they simply press a button, that student's card is still charged and they're paid as usual. But because we're protecting them uh, protecting them from that, they're actually incentivized to keep the students on the platform. And the students are incentivized to stay on the platform as well, because we're doing things like background checks and consistently vetting these instructors for quality. So it actually makes an ecosystem within our platform where the student and the instructor both want to stay. Excellent. Uh, uh, this is Wolf uh, with Bright Fun. Uh, number one, um, I am a kind of musician who is always trying to get better um and I'm, I'm constantly searching for bass instructors who are significantly more skilled than i am and this this makes so much sense how would someone like myself or one of my peers be able to go direct to you to find instructors at different levels uh, literally just go to the website. Um, so the beauty of our uh, platform is that we've already done the pre-vetting on each of these instructors. So to give you a little bit of an idea of that vetting process, we're looking at their educational background, student success, professional experience, and then we're also taking the time to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with each of these instructors. Uh, something that we realize very, very quickly, um, and I personally realize, is that just because a musician is a great musician, it does not make them a great instructor. Um, and so this is something that we take very seriously and so we're looking at instructors who not only have had storied music careers but you can also look at them and go okay their students have done extremely well one example of this is one of our violin teachers who his students took home six out of eight places in an international violin competition and so we feel pretty confident in saying 
if you can teach six kids to take home first through fifth place and honorable mention, you probably can teach it to some other people. And so what we do is when you go to the site and you complete that initial survey, you're gonna be presented with that initial list of instructors, but we're also asking you for additional information, like what are your goals? What's the music that you've been working on and what are you specifically looking for? From there, our team actually makes a personalized recommendation based off the criteria that you set for an instructor who would best fit your needs. And from there, you're welcome to do a test lesson and we're so confident in our instructors that we offer a 100% money back guarantee on every single lesson. Thank you. Thanks to Marcus, uh, great presentation and congratulations on your uh, Forbes 30 under 30. Thank you. Next up, our pitch contestant is Craig Lynn. Craig is the founder and CEO of Moving Day. Second to present. Hello everyone, my name is Craig Lynn, founder and CEO of Move Day, which streamlines and simplifies apartment movements. Have you ever moved into a large apartment community where the leasing office is not responsive and not communicating the moving process clearly to you? Well, that's because move-ins can be complicated and time-consuming for property managers. Redundant moving questions, too many phone calls, back and forth emails. This leads to bad move-ins that make bad first impressions. As a busy property manager, you only get one first impression. Move-in-day solves this by creating seamless move-in experiences. With a centralized hub of all the move-in information, we simplify and streamline the entire move-in process. Ultimately, we are delivering peace of mind for both property managers and their new residents. And we've got early traction. We launched our web app in September and started beta testing with four properties in LA, of which have a total of 781 units. In just the past three months, we've had 110 move-ins processed through Move-in Day. So what does Move-in Day look like? Imagine that you are the property manager at Start Out Apartments. You log into Moving Day's web portal where you can see all the new residents who are about to move into the building. Great group of new residents, it looks like. It's here you can invite your new resident. In this instance, we have Shyla moving in. Shyla, the new resident, receives an email and a text message welcoming her to start up apartments. Shyla logs into Moving Day and they can see more information about moving into start up apartments. She can see her specific unit information required move-in tasks that the property manager requires her to complete prior to moving in, frequently asked questions, pictures of where to park the truck, important phone numbers of the building, information on the office staff, really great team by the way, and information about the amenities at the building. Property managers love us because we make the move-in experience seamless. We make the process easy and organized and we save property managers time. Our business model will be threefold. First, we'll charge property managers a subscription fee. Second, we'll charge moving providers such as renters insurance, moving companies, and truck rentals for the leads that we send them. And third, advertisements from businesses that want to target people who are moving. In terms of market, there are about 60,000 large apartment communities across the United States, of which there are about 8 million annual apartment moves. We're looking for introductions to regional property managers and VP level executives at large apartment community property management companies, as well as VCs and angel investors. So let's get in touch. Thank you so much. Thanks, Craig. Questions from our judges? All right. uh, this is Brad Steele. Um, this is, so are you focusing in any particular geography at the moment? Or are you yes. trying to go broadly across all the U.S.? So our go to market. And what's your impediment that going broadly? So, so for the first question, our go to market strategy is really to focus on the L.A. market, starting primarily in L.A. and then eventually to Orange County and San Diego. Um, but at the same time, we are open to expanding across the U.S. But the primary focus is to focus primarily just on the the Southern California market first. And what was your second question? Uh, more, you know, what would be an impediment to you to be able to, being able to really scale it across the, the, the entire country? 
I think the main impediment to scaling it across the country would be more of the moving side services, offering those types of services. That would probably be the challenges, depending on the type of business that we're offering, whether it's like moving companies, um, truck rentals. So that would probably be the impediment. And that's why we think it makes more sense to first focus on the LA market first, um, especially since the LA market is the second largest of the US. Thank you, Craig. Um, it's very impressive. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to learn a little or, or potentially a lot more about your advertising partners when you've got that third arm of, of your business, which is um, the companies that want to advertise to the new renters which are moving into the area. Is that very specific to the area or are you looking at national partners to come on in the way the post office does? We're looking at both. Initially, so one of the plans that we have is to add a local guide. So once people have moved in, they can learn about a curated list of interesting places in their immediate neighborhood. And then that would also include local advertisements. But we also imagine also including nationwide, national level type of advertisements, whether it's like IKEA or Bed Bath & Beyond, those types of businesses. Thank you. Beautiful deck, Craig. This is Alexis. Um, tell me a little bit more about how how are you evaluating what does an ideal um, complex look like? Is it based on beds, average rent? What's the profile of an of a really ideal target for you? Great question. So our ideal client profile is really a building 100 plus units or more, preferably newer. The best ideal client would be a lease up, which is a brand new building. So one of our biggest buildings has almost 400 units and obviously since it's a large building they've had a lot of turnover and a lot of movement uh, so anything really i think over 100 units makes the most sense we've had a couple of buildings that were a little bit smaller they've had some movement but not obviously quite as big as the larger buildings that are relatively newer especially the ones that are brand new lease ups thank you great thanks craig Next up, we'll have Dr. Tran Tu Han. She's the founder of Optic Surge. Great, thank you. Show my screen. Are you guys able to see the screen? Excellent. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Wynn. I am a biomedical engineer and surgeon. I currently am still practicing. I focus on breast cancer surgery and women's health. And the journey is quite exciting. About three years ago, our team came together from our various expertise. And let me just uh, present the screen here. Are you guys able to see that? So three years ago, our team came together from various expertise as clinicians and engineers, but also people who've really honed their craft in what they do as experts working in medical device and health tech, along with regulatory and along with transformative deep tech. People have worked at M&A and Medtronic, people have commercialized products, people have worked at the FDA and also uh, compliance. And really with a shared mission of improving patient care delivery, by focusing on workflow optimization at the bedside and in the operating room, along with leveraging mixed reality and artificial intelligence. I think this 2020 is a year to be remembered, but the what it has taught us is where the different bottlenecks are in the care continuum and where the paradigms are going to shift. And one of the technologies that we are currently about to pilot and then to commercialize is the ability to collaborate between healthcare workers and providers and really essentially improving those bottlenecks and improving the care continuum. As you could imagine, there's a lot of different aspects in healthcare that really hinders the way that people in the front line take care of patients, not just in the short term in the pandemic, but also in the long term. And that's really the ability for people to communicate and collaborate and also the resources in, in knowledge and capacity. Right now, other current platforms focuses on consumer to provider type of interaction in telehealth. You could imagine if I'm right in front of a patient and I need to collaborate with my colleague, it would be very difficult to hold up a phone on one hand or adjust a, a tablet on a rolling stand on one hand and trying to take care of that patient with the other hand. And so having a hands-free smart glasses system allow us to collaborate in a meaningful sense. 
more specifically, you could imagine you can have a thousand ventilators where you only have 10 people who know how to use them, and those 10 people cannot be in a thousand places at once. How do we expand that capacity, expand the knowledge, and allow them to collaborate in a meaningful way, in a seamless way that integrates into the workflow with the people already at bedside? And so our platform allow for a communication on three different levels. The first level is audioly, like we're doing now. The second is the ability to share first viewpoint from the a person wearing the glasses. And the third is the ability to communicate through annotation. And we'll show you a quick demo at the end to, to show you what we're able to do. But really the key here in terms of our solution is having a platform that is user-friendly and focused along with having a compliant platform that is agile and be able to use voice and gesture and have meaningful interactions and communication. We've seen a lot of great interest in our technology because the paradigm is shifting in healthcare. You can imagine that we have right now approximately 6,000 hospitals and emergency room, but there's already other infrastructure in place for collaboration and specialty care. There's 12,000 plus ambulatory surgery centers and offices, 7,000 plus dialysis centers and urgent care centers, 15,000 plus nursing homes and countless number of physician and specialty offices. And so now our technology will essentially take advantage of that infrastructure and allow people to be where they need to be and see what they need to see in order to expand that capacity and care. Our business model is very straightforward at this time with our telehealth platform using a SaaS model, understanding with our deep expertise in healthcare, the different uh, value propositions that we're bringing to market. And so now I think just to uh, be able to give us some time to do a quick demo, I, Caitlin, are you able to play that video for us? And so imagine being at bedside in healthcare, what you're going to be able to see when they play this video is that someone wearing the glasses being video from that end and then communicating with someone remotely on a tablet uh, and that the remote person is essentially brought there uh, through our technology. So, Dr. Wynn, I think we're at the end of your presentation. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. So Open team. Thanks, Dr. Open Wynn. team. Hello. Hey, Dr. Jun. Hey, too. I'm doing some surgeries on fruits, and I need some help. Sure. Can you see what I see? Yeah, you got a banana, a lemon, an orange, and an apple. Okay, excellent. Well, what should we do with the banana? Oh, let me show you. Let's make an incision right here. Perfect. Well, which one is the lemon? Well, let me show you. Great, thank you guys. Thanks, Dr. Wynn. Appreciate your presentation. Um, judges, any questions? Sure, I have a question. Um, Dr. Wynn, is this, um, it, thank you for that really cool presentation. Um, it, is this, this isn't a medical device, right? Or, or is there any, is, are there any regulatory um, kind of barriers or hurdles that, that surround this and getting this into operating rooms or surgical centers, et cetera? Yep. So great question. Right now, our focus is actually using it at bedside for collaboration in a digital health type of fashion. And so we have addressed that in terms of compliance and best practices in order to bring this to market. To, I will abstain from asking questions since we are already participating in your current round. Um, but I, I do want to say great presentation and um, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, then, uh, Dr. Tu, I'll take the last question here. Once again, you know, I'm also, I love that video. Um, tell me a little bit about 
how, how are you thinking about uh, compliance with HIPAA and is there anything that's to sit internally on your clinics or hospital servers in order to make this work or can you host it all yourself? Yeah, great question. And I think that there's a short term and there's a long term. What we're doing right now is actually rolling out some paid pilots. And we have some great partners that's going to help us refine and answer some of those questions. I think that there's definitely as we grow and just the potential to, that and how fast we're, the interest that we're getting for growth is, the there's definitely and ultimately the opportunity to to work with third parties such as the AWS uh, in order to optimize that, especially if they have HIPAA compliance and working towards that. So I think there's a huge potential there. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Dr. Wynn. We appreciate that. Pleasure. Next, Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Next up, we'll have Lee Honeywell, the CEO of Tall Poppy. Great, let me get queued up here real quick. My webcam going, sorry about this. Excellent, hey everybody. Awesome, so you should be able to see my screen there. Hey everyone, my name is Lee Honeywell. I'm the founder and CEO of Tall Poppy. Um, we're building a new kind of employee benefit focused on personal security. Um, a, oh, hold on, there we go. A problem that 28% of Americans have personally experienced, things like stalking, sexual harassment, threats of violence, and persistent harassment. We're talking specifically about harassment that comes from outside of the company. So not an employee harassing another employee, but rather internet jerks going after your individual employees. Um, I've been working in cybersecurity for coming up on 15 years now, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, prior to starting Tall Poppy, I was a technology fellow at the American Civil, T Civil Liberties Union, um, as well as helping build the security team at Slack. Um, I built an amazing team. We're the only all women and non-binary venture funded cybersecurity startup, which I think is particularly rad. Um, and what we've actually built um, is two main things, a cybersecurity software platform that helps individuals protect their personal security instead of like keeping the company safe from phishing or threats from to the sort of corporate infrastructure we focus on your employees personal safety and personal security so people's personal gmail accounts personal twitter online banking that kind of thing and then in addition to the proactive cybersecurity platform um, if an individual employee is is targeted, uh, we provide expert, compassionate, trauma-informed incident response services that are really, you know, uh, unique in the business. What the platform looks like, it's like no other cybersecurity tool you've used. It's not clunky. Um, it's beautiful. It's comforting. It's um, it intended to be used by someone who's like pretty stressed out. So we focus on really plain language. Um, you walk through this dash, you walk through a quick onboarding questionnaire, you land in this dashboard that gives you targeted, focused tasks to complete to improve your personal security. And you have a sense of completion of, of how much you've got done um, and what there is next to do. Uh, individual tasks focus on actionable steps that you can take to, to meaningfully improve your personal security. This isn't a bunch of like smoke and mirrors, like install this antivirus on your computer. I know I used to work at Symantec. Um, these are the things that actually make your online accounts safer. Um, and again, if someone is targeted as an individual, they're able to reach out to our team um, and we coordinate with the organization's existing cybersecurity team um, to provide that expert in incident response augmentation beyond your sort of standard protect the company security team. Um, we've got some amazing customers. We work with Twitch, including their top 200 streaming partners. Uh, we've worked with the Wikimedia Foundation, the folks who make Wikipedia. And when uh, the soon to be former president went after Twitter's individual employees were who they reached out to for support. Um, so we're looking for, uh, we're currently raising a post seed. Um, we're looking for introductions to angel investors who are focused on diversity and inclusion, security, and the future of work. Um, and our sort of sweet spot customer-wise is um, platform companies, folks who have sort of trust and safety team, maybe they have content creators on the platform. We really specialize in protecting those high value um, content creators, as well as employees who are sort of in the public eye because of their work. 
Really looking forward to connecting with folks after and thanks for the opportunity to demo. Thanks so much, Lee. Great presentation. Question from our judges? This is Wolf. I'll, I'll hop on quickly. Um, tell us a little bit more about your team. Um, you have some amazing oh, yeah. clients and great partnerships. Uh, how large are you? How's the breakup? How, how does it work? Um, yeah, so we're a pretty small team. We're really scrappy. Uh, six employees as well as a couple of contractors. Um, we uh, have a sort of incident response rotation across the existing team. Um, some of our engineers are also cross-trained as, uh, as incident responders. Um, my first full-time hire, I actually love telling this story, um, my engineer named Brooke Noonan, uh, she actually joined us from the Title IX like, sexual harassment office at Michigan State. So she's a trained rape crisis counselor and also a software developer, computer science degree, has worked as a coder before and, and is one of the main developers of our platform. Excellent. And um, what what does next year look like for you as you're you're taking? Oh my goodness, I'm so excited for next year. Um, it's building out the sales team. It's uh, scaling up that sort of go to market. Our you know we're really focused on this B two B like owning the sort of B two B personal cybersecurity market. Um, as we think that there's a really unique opportunity to to partner with companies to build capacity around this. Um, but and I, and I think that next year will be all about completely owning that market. We've got wonderful opportunities in the pipeline from, from a ton of name brands that you've heard of. Um, and so really focusing on, on closing those um, and scaling up the, the team on the sort of customer success and incident response side to support um, that increased customer base. And the sort of, you know, five years down the road vision is that this isn't just a B2B product. Um, we're learning from people who have these like, really kind of wild cybersecurity needs. Um, but all of these things that we're learning, we wanna be able to turn that into software that, that you know everyone on this call can use as their sort of trusted personal security advisor. You know, the, the, the world of cybersecurity has moved on from us having to worry about securing our laptops to how do we secure our online accounts? And I'd love to go into a lot more detail than this, this, this call allows about the, the big vision there of like what it means to be that sort of personal cybersecurity advisor. Um, but that's, you know, when Symantec bought LifeLock, they called digital safety a $10 billion market. We think that's barely scratching the surface. Thank you. Yeah, this, Lee, uh, great, uh, great UI there you've got um, on your product. It's beautiful. Um, just my Thank you. question is about uh, the pricing model. How does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we actually have two tiers of our service. Um, the standard service, which is primarily software based, um, is licensed on a per seat per year model. Typically runs around $200 per person per year, some discounting for really big accounts. Um, we, we like to cover as much of the company as we can, but sometimes it's like, oh, we're just gonna cover like the 500 people in our trust and safety organization or whatever. Um, we also offer this like second tier that we call our concierge service, um, which is more on the range of 2,500 to 3,500 per person per year. Um, and that's a, a customized one-on-one -on -one, um, personal security consultation. We'll typically do this with executives, um, with those you know, streaming partners who are, you know, have a million followers or whatever. They need something a little bit in more depth than our current software offering. Um, but again, it's all about that, you know, that fundamental thing of if we're going to make an ecosystem level impact in the problem of online harassment, it has to all be software. So that concierge service is a learning tool for us to build the software even better. Yeah, th this is a huge, huge problem you're addressing. I've seen this with a number of employees of, of my own uh, as a problem and, and, mm -hmm. and watched Amazon deal with it. How, what's the, the biggest objection you get to a sale when you're selling into a Twitter or a, you know, an Amazon? It's really interesting. Um, we, folks are sometimes like, I just want to cover this small set of employees. And I think the, when I, when I try to talk to folks into being like, you know, we can lower the cost a little bit, let's cover more people. It's really about um, getting the proactiveness. Um, when, when I talk to, particularly when I was talking to, we've pivoted slightly in terms of who our buyer is. Initially I was like, this is, you know, future of work, we're selling to HR, HR is the buyer. Um, and 
you know, two years ago, we were a little early for HR. We were typically talking to CISOs, um, like chief security officers. And uh, it really comes down to the, you know, any bit of pre prevention that you can put into place is going to pay off in droves, regardless of what the sort of specific circumstance of someone being targeted is. And we talk a lot about poor Bob in accounting, who's like not public facing at all, but he had a bad breakup and his ex is sharing his nudes and it's really messy. And like, we want to be able to help Bob, even if Bob isn't like a super high profile person within the organization. So, yeah. Interesting. Thanks, Lee. We appreciate your pitch. Um, thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to pitch. Great. Next up, we have Oscar Pedorso, CEO of Epo. All right. I'm just going to queue up here as well. All right, let me get started here. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Oscar Pedroso and I'm the founder and CEO of Thimble. So Thimble is a monthly subscription program for middle school and high school kids that teaches them robotics, computer science, and engineering skills. Uh, we do this through uh, monthly delivered STEM kits that come with live and on-demand instruction. So the pandemic closed about 97% of schools. Uh, they either closed or went remote. And there are about 32 million parents in the US who have kids between the ages of 10 and 19 years old who do not have the time, tools, or expertise to homeschool their kids. In fact, they're going pretty frantic at the moment. And they're trying to solve three things. They're trying to keep their kids from falling behind academically. They're also trying to balance their screen time with meaningful hands-on activities. And parents are also trying to keep their own sanity by getting their own time back to focus on their own work with few distractions as possible. So what we do at Thimble here is we created a monthly subscription curriculum that consists of a 48-month roadmap. Uh, and that includes 16 different types of robotics and coding kits that includes synchronous and asynchronous instruction. So right now we have 1,100 subscribers. Uh, even though we've been doing this for a couple of years, we actually switched to direct to consumer earlier this year when schools closed. Uh, and we saw massive growth over the summer. Um, so we have 1,100 subscribers. We're doing about 32K in MRR and we're growing 30% month over month. Our customer retention is actually really high at the moment. It's almost a little over 99%. And while we only have seven months of data, our projected lifetime value is about $2,300. And our average customer acquisition cost across a few channels is around $50. So here are some examples of some kits you can build. We, we assume that kids have no prior knowledge. You learn how to build basic circuits, eventually learn how to build a Wi-Fi remote control car, a piano synthesizer. You can even build a drone on your own kitchen table with no experience. So part of the offering is included um, on, in our lesson library. We have step-by-step um, -step instructions, which include video tutorials, a forum, uh, quizzes, ways to keep kids engaged in and outside of class. And our third component, since it is hybrid, is live build-along classes. So kids get two weekly classes with real instructors. And some of those instructors are um, what we call celebrity designers who come from companies like Apple, Nintendo, Minecraft, who can really share their perspective on how they got to where they are now. So our business model, it's uh, $60 a month. This is only one of a various packages, but this is our main one. And what's included is you get a quarterly delivered kit, aid live classes, and access to our lesson and video library. So we're across between like a Khan Academy, a KiwiCo, and various master class like websites, where really the emphasis is on uh, tying together, a, building a physical device with uh, various types of lessons and tutorials. So Joel and I, Joel is my co-founder, he and I have been working together for five years. We both come from the education sector. We taught math for a few years. I worked in admissions uh, and we came together to really make this more accessible to, to kids across the US and also make this a necessary topic that many schools aren't teaching at the moment. 
While we've had many ways of getting this to market, our most popular channel has been our referral program. 50% of our customer base has come from our referral program. We've had uh, super users that have shared Thimble with up to seven families. One in particular was up to 15. Um, but this is just one of the ways we've been uh, getting to market. Um, our, uh, we're projected to hit 1,300 subscribers by end of year. Now that we're in holiday season, just had a fantastic Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Uh, and we're looking to grow exponentially over the next few years to get this into the hands of many, many families. And there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> and my last slide. You better be good, right? <laughs> All right, so yeah, we're raising a post-seed round. Uh, we are about 60% committed on this round, and we're looking for any investors that are interested in being a part of our mission. And um, happy to answer any questions. You know, we're not just changing kids' educational experiences, nor are we, uh, are we changing what kids can do with themselves. We really are trying to change who society sees as engineers, chemistries, uh, chemists, biologists, any sort of science discipline you can think of. Um, we are looking to be the brand that tomorrow's tech leaders will finally look back on as their childhood inspiration. And happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Oscar. Great presentation. I do have a question. I want to start off with your customer acquisition cost. It seems pretty high. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's high on the social media side, on the paid acquisition side. It's generally between, like right now, it's hovering around $80 to $100. Um, but we have brought that down through our referral program, which is about $30. Um, we just started testing paid acquisition a couple months ago, so it is something that we're looking to fine tune over time. We started doing a lot of the advertising ourselves, but are learning to let go of that um, just because it's not something that we can do very well. And we are starting to see uh, uh, optim optimization happening um, across, especially paid acquisition. Okay, sounds good. So judges, questions? Hey, uh, Oscar, um, I'm curious, so when did you start this company? So we started it three and a half years ago, uh, and we launched it selling to schools, and we pivoted to direct-to-consumer earlier this year. Got it. Uh, and uh, the reason I was asking is you, taught, you touched on uh, COVID being a, you know, sort of a, a catalyst for potentially for growth for the company. Um, and I just was curious if you know what was the inspiration for starting it was it was it because because of the reasons you said around you know parents needing to find ways to keep their kids uh, um, up to speed and to educate them inside the home and to keep their sanity or was it because of a a greater cause and and um, something that you saw was was deeply missing in society and I, so I'm, I'm trying to get from like what, what what's inspired you to start this. Yeah, I mean, I'm a first generation. I'll start with where I'm from. Like, I'm originally from New York City. My parents are from Honduras. I'm the first uh, person in my family to graduate from college and first in my family to start a business. And uh, really, like, my experience working within the school districts, working with kids who look just like me but didn't have the same type of resources growing up. Um, and a lot of these seeds were planted early on after I graduated from college, but I wasn't able to really act on the idea. Um, so we started this idea to, to really inspire kids to, to consider tech as an education and possible career path down the line. It just happened so that, you know, we started working with schools and then with schools shutting down, we really didn't have this path to go anywhere, really. And it was really through just forums, connecting with friends that have kids in that age bracket that we were able to see the traction that attraction that we've never really seen before. Got it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Oscar. Uh, this is Wolf. Uh, first off, I think edutech is one of the most important industries for, for both upside and, um, and need right now. Um, I've got two kids at home and the world is very different than it was a year ago. So I'm just curious if, uh, if if 2020 did not happen, what would what would be different right now? And then what are you doing differently going into 2021 uh, based on what you've learned over the last year? Yeah, I mean, we'd probably still be tackling schools, to be honest. Uh, 
and education has been completely turned on its head this year. Uh, and in many ways, it's a good thing. I think remote learning, while it existed pre-pandemic, I think it's here to stay and it's gonna to continue to evolve. And I personally think it's gonna be a way that we teach the masses. Um, even heading into the school year in September, we thought our growth rate would actually drop and it actually maintained and even continued to increase during the holiday season. Uh, so I, I do think heading into 2021 and 2022, this is just gonna be even more relevant. And if anything, schools are gonna also have to step up their game because clearly they're not delivering on this. Um, as we're seeing right now, a lot of our customers are either without this kind of education or their school district just simply can't offer it for a variety of reasons. Thank you. And, and with your customer base, when you're talking to schools, both pre-pandemic and, and currently, are you looking more towards charter schools or larger districts? for your implementation? I'm thinking charter schools. It's pretty tough to work with larger school districts. And I say that just from work, uh, from experience. Uh, generally the smaller, either charter schools um, or even private schools to some extent are easier to work with just because of decision-making isn't as erratic. Um, but currently actually we're just, we're, we're while we're not working with those schools, we're actually doing more work with micro schools and various, what they're known as pandemic pods. Um, that's been one other way we've been able to, to tap into our market. Thank you. Um, and I know this isn't the advice section, but I would say if there's ever been a moment to work with those larger districts, that this is now and, and those districts need you. And I think this could be incredible. Thank you so much, Oscar. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you again, Oscar. Thimble will definitely be on uh, Santa's gift giving list in my family this year. Um, so tell me a little bit about sourcing. How are you keeping the kits fresh and relevant as you grow your portfolio over time? Definitely. Well, we started off with our own list of projects that we wish we had when we were in school. That was really the, uh, the precursor for all of the kits that we have now. Um, about half of our kits are ideas that some of our own uh, users have had in the past year. Um, so we'll usually share, we'll usually put it out there um, either in terms of um, in the shape of a contest or we'll send out an email asking for ideas. And so now we have a laundry list of about 50 to 70 different types of projects that, that we can create that not only use things like Arduino microcontrollers, but there's Raspberry Pi microcontrollers, there's soldering involved, there's all different types of coding. So it's not just um, C++, there's Python, HTML. I mean, we try to cover the gamut, really. Uh, but yeah, that's how we try to we try to stay as close as possible to to our to the kids. Um, the parents, you know, they probably don't have a lot to say in that department. But it's really the kids who um, tell us, "Hey, I want I want to learn how to build a uh, a a drone." And so we're here trying to figure that out. Awesome. Thank you. Great, thanks, Oscar. I appreciate the presentation, especially around EduTech, one of my favorite sort of sectors out there. So great job. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Next up, we'll have Megan Leary. She is, uh, I'm sorry. She is a co-founder and VP of Turazo. Welcome, Megan. Hello. All right. I think we see it. Okay. Hi everybody, I'm Megan O'Leary, co-founder of Terrazzo. Um, I'm also an Olympic athlete, hence the sling. Um, and prior to this, spent several years building a career in the sports and media industry. 10 years ago when I entered the industry, being a woman and a woman that identified as LGBTQ, it was hard to be myself and feel safe in that, but I also felt like I was often overlooked for either jobs or promotions because I wasn't a part of the old boys club. This experience and the deep appreciation I have in coaching and the importance of a team informed the creation of Terrazzo. We are a B2B SaaS company. And our product is a white label platform that enables mid to large size corporations to create a more inclusive and authentic hiring process. The pandemic and recent top down corporate mandates to improve workforce diversity has driven customer interest and market pool, higher demand in our product. How are we doing this? We fit neatly in a gap that we identified several years ago that's be but has become even more relevant recently, 
in between a company's sourcing and outreach tools and their application process or ATS, application tracking systems. How we do this is through the white label platforms we build for our companies. They're private invitation only networks. These are real customer networks. As you can see, it's everything, look and feel, branding, scheme, color, all in the taxonomy of our customers. The value of the experience is that it's candidate driven. A company can invite in thousands of prospects to connect for highly engaging one-on-one -on -one conversations with employees in the roles, living the lives and having shared backgrounds of those candidates. When invited into a network, a candidate can choose from functional knowledge or business area, but most importantly, and what we really encourage our customers to lean into, are these conversation topics or culture-driven areas. So for example, Under Armour has listed all of their employee resource groups. So I, as a candidate, can come in, find someone that I have a shared background in, read a little bit more about her, and the joy is I can book a session right away from her calendar and have a real conversation with a real employee at the company to better understand what life is like at Under Armour. All of the engagement the sessions happen via the platform this is important for several reasons. The companies can collect a really high amount of data from these interactions, understanding what candidates are interested in the company, but the candidates are also reviewing the company and the employees are reviewing the candidates, therein creating a lot more informed data that funnels into the ATS not only creating, again, a more inclusive process, but real data rather than just an AI or just a resum resume filtering process. Where we are right, where we are right now is, uh, is significantly expanding. COVID um, and the recent conversation in light around having a real diversity and inclusive strategy um, has you know, put us into the limelight. These are just the brands currently in our pipeline. We're already seeing expansion with current customers who are wanting to create a second network internally. The market opportunity is significant. We've already proven use case in that early, what we call campus hiring, but DNI, we're seeing traction in mid-career and where the real money, the real opportunity is in that full life cycle hiring process. We believe that we can build a multi-billion dollar company through this land and expand approach. What we're asking, as of this morning, we've actually oversubscribed the ask that I, when I applied a few weeks ago. We are taking small investments to fill out this current go-to-market round that's enabling us to further build out our team and to really capitalize on the opportunity we have to stay out in front of the competition and position us well for a significant series or significant seed or a true series A in Q1 of 2021. We're trying to revolutionize the recruiting uh, environment and process, and we think we, we've proven it up to this point, and finally companies are paying attention. Um, so we're excited about the progress we have up to date um, and are, you know, asking for people to they believe in our mission, but also any company introductions as well. Nice. Uh, great product. Thanks a lot, Megan. Questions from our judges? Megan, could you tell us a little bit about the team? Yeah, so I'm a co-founder. We have a co-founding team. Uh, my fellow co-founder, you see his name up there, Pete Chiplone. He is, he has a background in, um, he's the technical founder. So he has a background in SaaS. Um, he spent 20 years um, with a company called Factiva for a long time, but enterprise SaaS sales um, and development. And then our CTO, Chief Technical Officer, is a gentleman by the name of Kevin Collins. He was the lead product manager for Stitch Fix for a long time. He was co-founder of a couple other startups, uh, Red Tricycle, um, and has a you know, deep background um, in product management. We have a sales advisor um, who spent 20 years um, building sales teams. He's come in to help us. Um, we have an advisor who is well entrenched in the HR space, who is the basically second head of people at Zoom, um, Kim Blue. So we're well informed in terms of advising. And then our team, you know, beyond the leadership team, we have about 11, um, five of which are full-time, but 11 people total. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and this this is Wolf. What, what are your goals for the next two years? Where do you see yourself um, at the end of 2022? Yeah, I mean, we see an opportunity where, you know, we're, I think on that last slide, we're trying to close, you know, an additional 10 by the end of the year. We have the pipeline to do it. We'd like to close another 100 by the end of next year and really beyond that. 
um, grow to where we are the, the leader in a space that we see that we've created a category. Uh, we've yet to see any competition um, that is doing exactly what we're doing and it's being affirmed by our customers saying, we didn't know that we needed you until we saw your product and now we know we need you. Um, and so we'd love to be the leader in you know, what we're calling relationship-based um, approach to recruiting. Great, Megan, are your customers the folks who, uh, I guess, are the tried and true and have always been really intentional about the recruiting or are you pursuing the folks who maybe have gotten caught up in the past year and called out and are saying, oh shit, we have to figure out how to change this? What, what are you seeing so far? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's, because we've been around, you know, we launched, like we've been around since 2015 and we were pushing this as we knew it would work. We had early adopters, but co you know, COVID, um, the, you know, again, the, the corporate mandates on, hey, the reality is that the, the splashy stock photo on a website isn't, that's not a true diverse and inclusive recruiting strategy. So, you know, Xerox is a perfect example of that, of like, hey, we've gotten it wrong and we need a solution. But a company like Microsoft, um, has a flashy, you know, logo, and people know their brand. Um, but they're they're an archaic company that also needs improvement in their strategies. So we have a lot of big companies. I would say it's industry specific where we're getting the interest of some of the companies who realize that they have a lot of room to make up in this area. So financial services um, is a big target. You know, we have a lot of interest from those companies that are quintessentially mostly male, mostly white, mostly elite, um, and then even tech companies that are mostly male um, in terms of diversifying and bringing in more, more women and people of color. Thank you. What, what's behind the name? <laughs> yeah, so it's a, um, it's a combination of a couple words. Uh, Turas is, is Gaelic and it means journey. And then Zoe is actually of African origin and it means guide. Um, the idea is that, you know, one of the most important uh, journeys that you'll take in your life is your career. And that we believe that, you know, our technology and our approach can help guide that career in a much more authentic and meaningful way. Thank you, that's interesting. It's very interesting. Thanks so much, Megan. And thanks to all of our participants tonight. Um, we appreciate all of the founders pitching for Demo Day. And so just a reminder, we're going to go, the judges are going to go off and vote. But in the meantime, I just want to remind everyone of the companies. So we have Music, we have Moving Day, Optic Surge, Tall Poppy, Fimble, and Terrazzo. And so we will have an audience poll for you all to vote on your favorite. This will not um, determine the, the winner in the end, but we want to give everybody uh, in the audience an opportunity to, to um, share who their favorite is through our poll. So if you have a chance, vote on our poll. You will have two, we'll have one, and then you'll be able to see another one shortly after. 30 seconds. Great, thanks a lot. Now for our second poll, we have 30 seconds for this one. Great, thanks so much for everyone. We um, appreciate you voting in the poll. So next up, we're gonna hear from our sponsors again. So we will hear from the folks from AWS and SVB. Next up, so Ari and Julie. Ooh, that light is brutal. Let's move somewhere else, cool. Hi folks, my name is Ari Kalfayan. I work at AWS on the Startup BD team specifically uh, on AIML startups. And before I share my screen, I'm just gonna talk to you guys about 
what we do quickly. And I'd like to introduce myself actually. And most of the time I just introduce myself as a founder who's built two successful machine learning companies, serial entrepreneur. But I think like, especially Oscar share really inspired me today. Like I come from the Bay Area, but my family came here from Lebanon. English was my second language. I lost my father at five. And even though I grew up in the Bay Area, I never thought entrepreneurship was like a real opportunity that I could like pursue. Even growing up in San Carlos, it just wasn't a thing. And as I went to college and I started to like mature, I just started seeing problems that I wanted to solve. And instead of letting someone else do it, I stepped up and did it myself and built teams around that. So I want to thank all the entrepreneurs who pitched today who are really inspiring. And they're like all the judges who are offering such great commentary. And it's just such cool examples of creativity that's thriving in our community. Um, and I think like one of the things that I want to talk about with AWS is that we have a strong bias for action. If we see a problem, we want to solve it. If there are entrepreneurs solving that problem, we want to help those entrepreneurs solve big problems. So we made a commitment this year and in the years past, I joined a year ago just for background to create a more inclusive and diverse startup environment and really use our position of privilege to help create a diverse and inclusive environment for entrepreneurs, for investors, um, and everyone that supports the community. So that's the kind of commitment that led me to AWS, and this is the type of event that we are grateful to participate in. So let me show you a little bit about how we can actually help. Cool. So, one thing to note, like when you think about AWS, you think of a big organization, but really my team in Startup BD, we are a bunch of ex-founders, VCs, operators that have been in the trenches. And we've helped startups from the beginning. I mean, when Travis pitched Uber to me eight years ago, I'm like, tell me when you have an Android phone. And it's, it's so cool to see startups develop from ideas to their first product to huge organizations, some IPO, some sell. And even the ones that don't succeed, you learn a ton and you move on to the next company as an entrepreneur. And we're really like just obsessed with helping you. And it's your success uh, is measured by like how we connect you to different programs, not how much you spend. And in fact, we've been, built an entire ecosystem to support you. So whether that's connecting you with angels, VCs, accelerators, marketing opportunities, technical resources, um, we have a ton of stuff we can help you with. And really it boils down to three things, right? It's investment, expertise, and customers. And in that, we're helping tens of thousands of startups actually build on AWS and also leverage our ecosystem. So that starts with Activate. So we have a dedicated team that helps you get um, non-dilutable, we make a non-dilutable investment in the form of Activate credits and POC credits with specific services. We host technical office hours, um, free trainings, and we just want to help you build a scalable product. So we'll talk to you about how to like leverage our products. Um, we'll give you technical resources, like it's reInvent this week. We'll give you beta access to some of the products you need, um, and also give you co-op uh, marketing opportunities through speaking engagements um, and the startup blog. And then as just like fellow entrepreneurs and humans, we want to connect you personally to our VC network, accelerators, incubators, and we have ways to actually accelerate your go-to-market journey, especially for B2B customers. So with Startout, I'm really excited because we've got to like, a, as a former entrepreneur who's leveraged the Startout ecosystem, I mean, I, I will share vulnerably, one of the main reasons I hear working with AWS is because I was connected to an amazing mentor, Max, who was able to help me with the go-to-market and especially the marketing side of my last machine learning business. And it's that type of mentorship that we want to provide. So we have over 40 mentors that have already signed up internally that want to help you build your startup. And there are even more folks at AWS that have signed up for the Startup um, Expert Network to help you with VC, look at your pitch deck, help you go to market, help you with marketing. So we have a broad uh, network of folks that want to help you. And then we can also help connect you to industry events like reInvent, Remars, connect you to our startup blog. Um, and make personal interest to investors. So with that, here's my email. I'm happy to help in any way. And I'm also excited to announce we do have underrepresented uh, founders, BD, who we just hired to help 
all underrepresented founders. So if you want to shoot me an email, I'm happy to help on a personal network level and also connect you to folks internally at AWS who can help. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to SVB. Thanks. Thanks, Ari. Um, first off, uh, kudos to everyone that presented. There were some uh, fantastic ideas, and I envy uh, the judges who have a, a pretty difficult decision um, on their hands. Um, so uh, bear with me while I just pull up my slides, and you'll actually see um, a lot of commonality between uh, how SVB and AWS approach um, you know, founders and how we work with our companies. And um, if, if I can leave you with um, one thing today in the, on the banking front, um, here are some, some actionable um, steps you can take, um, you know, as you're starting out, maybe as you're starting out or well on your way as a founder. So uh, number one, um, I think this goes without saying, but choose the right long-term partner, right? As uh, similar to um, our team at SVB uh, at AWS, uh, you know, SVB is not only made up of folks that are um, that have been banking their whole careers, but also uh, we have a dedicated evangelist team that includes people that were founders, operators, worked at uh, funds, worked with family offices. And why that's relevant is we really understand the founder journey, right? We've, uh, since our founding almost 40 years ago, um, our focus has exclusively been on early stage companies, um, unlike a lot of larger financial institutions. So make sure you, you choose a partner that can support you, not just now, but more importantly, as you scale. Um, the second, and I, I can't stress this, enough um, is separate out personal and corporate expenses. Um, I'd say this is uh, probably a mistake I see uh, most first-time founders make. Um, and, uh, you know, everyone knows the statistics about um, how difficult it is to succeed as a founder. Um, so you do really want to um, make sure your personal and corporate are separated from the get-go. Um, at SVB, we don't tie any of your any of our products to your personal credit history, meaning you as a founder. Um, we don't ask for any personal guarantees, and so that's something really important to, to keep in mind. And number three, um, you know, cash is king. Um, so we recommend taking some um, pretty important steps from the get-go that would help you manage cash. So implement a corporate credit card program so you don't have employees paying for company expenses on their own. Um, sign up for business insurance. Uh, we have a great partner, Vouch. Um, you know, I'm happy to um, connect anyone who's interested. Um, and, and of course, keep track of spending habits, right? If, if we saw anything from COVID, it was that the companies that were the best capitalized um, were the ones most likely to write this thing. Um, switching to how we work with our founders, again, like I said, a lot of themes that, that Ari hit, we have a very founder-friendly banking solution. What that means for you is we don't charge any fees, there's no monthly minimums. Um, and as early stage founders, you know this first hand, right? The banking needs at this stage are fairly limited. And so our goal is to help you get set up with a bank account as quickly as possible so you can go back to focusing on the product. Because we understand the founder journey, um, you know, we are very thoughtful about, um, about how, we, how we look at debt. We were one of the first uh, people to find their venture debt, which is something we recommend all companies um, consider, uh, particularly after or when they're using a Series A round. Um, it's a it's minimally uh, dilutive. So you know if you have let's say you have a, a 10 million um, capital need instead of raising 10 million equity, you could raise a little bit less equity, supplement that with debt, and that way um, you know as a founder you're still you're not diluting yourself as much. Um, again, we have a fantastic network not just in Silicon Valley but 
across all startup ecosystems. Our goal is to help our companies with everything and anything beyond banking. Um, some examples, um, you know, with our B2B companies, we've made um, introductions to early customers or design partners. If you think about who startups are selling into, more likely than not, those companies also bank with us. Uh, we've helped with hiring. We've made introductions to our venture network so we can help you close your run faster. Um, and again, we do a lot of things um, to uh, to aid that founder journey, like uh, uh, organizing safe spaces, helping with pitch practice. Um, and so don't hesitate to reach out if I can help with anything. Um, I plan on, on uh, sharing my email uh, later, but it's jwilson at svb.com. If there's anything I can do to be helpful, please don't hesitate to reach out. And with that, I'll uh, turn it back to Sean. Thanks so much, James. And thanks for SBB. They're a great partner of ours as well. So really appreciate that. Um, while we're waiting for the judges, we will open up for a, cu a couple of questions. If anyone has anything they would like to ask, we would um, be happy to answer a few. Please shoot away. Shyla, we have one question. Okay. And it looks, looks like it is from, um, it is for Music Book. Um, so this would be for DeMarcus. Marcus, okay. Yeah. All right. Let me just pull up the question. Um, the question was around um, whether there are sliding scales for potential students um, and whether you have any funding programs for students who may not otherwise be able to afford lessons. Yeah, so um, as far as sliding scales, I'm assuming you're referring to um, cost-wise. So our teachers have a range of prices. So while our average cost for a lesson is $80 an hour, um, and we have teachers that go up as high as $275 an hour, uh, we do also make sure to make it a point of also allowing college students to teach on our platform. The reason why we do this is because a lot of college students have not completed their degrees yet. However, they've studied music since they were five or six years old, and so they're incredibly good teachers. This also allows them to price themselves at much lower than, say, a professional musician who plays with the New York Philharmonic and so it democratizes that access. On the flip side of that we also do work with corporate partners like Adidas who I mentioned who Adidas actually paid us to provide music lessons to kids in the Atlanta area through their Sound Labs program. So we do this with a number of organizations to bring them in because I was one of those kids who could not afford lessons. I currently as a professional play on an instrument that is on loan to me by a um, generous donor because I couldn't even afford to purchase an instrument um, and throughout my life I had multiple random um, really random people who pay for music lessons uh, throughout my life. So it's very important for me that other people who look like me and who come from um, not the best socioeconomic backgrounds uh, have access to quality music education because music ultimately changed my life. So that's something that we're always doing. We're always working to get more corporate partners in to be able to subsidize the cost of those lessons um, to make sure that everyone has access because you shouldn't be limited by who you can study with or the quality of your education just because you don't have the money. Thanks, DeMarcus. Uh, Chris, we have a question related to uh, start out specifically, um, if you wouldn't mind putting us, putting, putting you on the spot a little bit. Sure. Great. Um, the question was from Mallory. Um, it is, how do you um, choose which companies get to pitch and when is the next demo day? Good question. Um, I mean, generally we have a lot of uh, uh, participants in our demo days that are part of our growth lab. We have a, a two cohorts a year of roughly six companies uh, that participate in the growth lab. So oftentimes one of the growth lab companies 
will uh, you know will participate, and and then we've got you know a selection committee uh, as well that kind of goes through a variety of of uh, of applications that we receive uh, on the on the website uh, as well. Um, our next um, uh, demo day will be uh, in fall, the, the fall of 2021. Um, so that's kind of uh, generally uh, how it works. And, uh, and then, you know, we, we will also get different recommendations from, from our partners and, and uh, other investors and venture capital firms that are part of our investor portal. So a lot of, a lot of different uh, sources that for the selection committee to, uh, to work with. Um, and it's it's oftentimes difficult to choose because we get so many uh, applications for participants in our growth lab and also uh, for our for our demo days. But definitely check out you know startout.org to uh, to learn more. Thanks, Chris. Sure thing. Any other questions before we? Um get back with the judges. Okay, so I have one here from Patrick, um, and it's a question for Lee. So if Lee, you can come back up. So um, Patrick wants to know, could you discuss a little bit more about your sales pipeline and raise schedule? Also, any product validation via testimonials or VC pipeline would be great to hear about as well. Oh, goodness. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so a number of the companies that we have in our sales pipeline are um, sort of platform focused companies where there's some sort of influencer type of group, um, say fitness instructors. Um, so we're talking to some high profile fitness related companies um, would be a really good example. Uh, the other place where we've, we made some sales this fall and have a bunch more in the pipeline are sort of um, election related infrastructure. Um, there's a couple of companies in the sort of uh, infrastructure space that do fundraising and that kind of thing um, that we're talking to. Uh, on the raise side, um, we've got 20, 20 plus percent committed towards a $2.5 million raise. Um, we're talking to sort of angels towards like until the end of the year. And then the plan is to, um, in the new year, uh, talk primarily to funds and you know aim to close out the round. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Lee. Sweet. Okay. This is for. Oh, I'm not really sure who this is for. Okay. It doesn't really tell me who it's for. So we will give it another minute or so before we announce the winner. Um, but if you have any more questions, please feel free to weigh in before we do. And I just want to remind everyone that the winner will get an introduction to SBV to a VC that matches the industry and space as ideally as possible for a one-hour consultation. So um, again, thanks everyone. And we want to go ahead and announce our winner. Our winner is Optic Surge. So thanks so much. Um, you want to come back up, Dr. Wynn? Yeah, hi. Congratulations on your Thank win tonight. We really, really appreciate your presentation. Appreciate Any you guys. You want to I'm really impressed. I got learned a lot today from all the different entrepreneurs and also the community. Really appreciate the sponsors as well. And of course the judges, Chile, I think you did a great job. So really, thanks. Great, thanks so much. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight for Demo Day with Startout. We really appreciate you being here and, and, and hope you'll stay connected with Startout and all the wonderful things for the, that they're doing for the diverse entrepreneur community. Again, have a wonderful evening. Good night.